Chapter 16, Sleep. Think in the morning, act in the noon, eat in the evening, sleep in the night. William Blake. Oh, sleep, you fancy little unicorn. I used to wonder if people who said that they slept regularly eight hours a night were just liars. I couldn't remember a time in my life where I had slept more than four consecutive hours. I didn't know what it meant, what that meant while I was dealing with it, and I just assumed that it was normal since no one had told me otherwise. Unfortunately, there is a misguided belief that sleep is something that can be sacrificed. All day long, our routines and daily lives require excessive amounts of energy from the body. Sleep is the only time the body allows repair. The body is expected to perform all day long, physically, mentally, and psychologically. Physiologically. These processes require calorie consumption in order to keep up with the demand. Only when we finally stop taking in new information and relax is the body able to start repairing whatever damage was done throughout the day. If you do not give yourself adequate time to repair, the body has less of an opportunity to naturally fix things. After time, the body starts to shut down different areas to conserve, different, to conserve energy for a day-to-day -day physical demand. Let me put it another way. Not getting enough sleep is like not letting your leg properly heal after a broken bone. Imagine you are two weeks from getting your cast removed and you were supposed to be in a wedding. So you ask your doctor to remove the cast a few weeks early against their recommendation. You promise to take it easy. Unfortunately, while having a blast at the wedding, the bone shifts a little. It never quite heals right after that. You limp on it, and at some point your knees and hips start to hurt, and lower back pain set, starts to set in. The domino effect of not getting enough sleep can build up in the body and present itself as pain and symptoms. Sleeping is like this, and it should be seen this way. All day long you, wear, you put wear and tear on your muscles, organs, skin, brain, and so forth, and all those areas need proper nourishment each night. The better reset your body, it, the better rested your body is is the fewer ailments it will have because it never got behind on healing. Each night you may, you get to reset the clock and start fresh. When we constantly deprive ourselves of that crucial time, we allow the body to get behind on healing and it cannot quite keep up. I completely understand the struggle here. It is hard to change your routine. And what, you're, what if you are dealing with insomnia too? Then sleep seems unattainable and possibly a point of contention. I was just like this. Go to bed. I remember sitting across from my new integrative medicine doctor that I had finally gotten to see after months of being on the waiting list and her telling me that the best way to heal my body right then would be to make sure that I was making sleep a priority. She was taking her job seriously, so I was trying to be as serious as possible too. So imagine my surprise when I laughed in her face. What, I, what blurted out of me next had to be a jumble of the following excuses. Do you know I have two small children, a full-time job, and a husband who owns his own business? Where do you want me to fit more sleep in? I thought at that moment, this woman is bad. She obviously doesn't know anything about my life. I know that I am an insomniac who only needs about four hours of sleep at night, and I do my best days with fewer than six anyways. How could I possibly need more sleep, and how could this actually help me? As a researcher, I wanted to get to the bottom of this whole sleep thing. This doctor had clearly had her best had my best interests at heart and wanted me to heal. I started researching the importance of sleep, all while thinking that going to bed any earlier would do would not help heal my body. I've read studies that show getting a 15 minute nap can reset you in the middle of the day. So why should I need more than six hours at night? Research showed that we actually do most of our healing and our bodies during this time of rest. I was thinking, crap, I'm totally screwed. There's no way I'm going to be able to sleep more. I imagine that if I could do everything else right, here comes the overachiever in me. Eat the perfect foods, no such thing. Think positive thoughts, see a chiropractor and an acupuncturist, take all the supplements and do it all perfectly. Then I didn't have to sleep more, right? Wrong. Once I finally started to make sleep a priority, I started healing leaps and bounds. I told people I couldn't go out at night, I set a bedtime for myself, and I forced myself to lie down without the lights on. Some nights I would do a whole routine before bed to prepare myself for sleep. I started sleep training for the first time in my life. Did you know that sleep is a learned behavior? We are taught at a young age to learn how to go to bed. As we get older, other activities become more important than sleep. It is not surprising to find out that a majority of us sacrifice our sleep for the daily routine. I used to think that it was selfish to go to bed early because it felt like I had given more of myself away before I was allowed to do something nice for myself, like go to sleep. Also, I never really thought of going to sleep as doing something nice for myself because I had no idea the impact it would make to just go to bed a few hours earlier or let myself sleep in a bit later. 
It is especially hard to go to bed if you're a parent or caretaker because you know that you'll get a magical time in the house where all of a sudden everything is quiet. If you clean, it will stay clean. If you watch a movie, you won't be interrupted. If you have to go pee, you can close the door. With so many tasks that need to happen after the kids go to bed, it is enticing to extend that time as much as we can. I understand the many challenges that can prevent us from going to bed earlier and getting more sleep, work hours, children, demanding schedules, and more. All of this makes it difficult for us to give ourselves the permission we need to go to sleep a little bit earlier. Sleep is such an integral part of healing and staying healthy that even if the only thing you take from this book is that maybe you get an extra hour of sleep every night or an hour more in the morning, then maybe that's enough. Maybe that will make the difference in your life. Again, we heal when we're sleeping. If we aren't getting the sleep or if the sleep quality is poor, including drug-induced or alcohol-induced sleep, the body cannot heal or regenerate the way that it should. I challenge you to give yourself a little grace, a little bit of time, a little bit of self-love, by trying to get in bed a little bit earlier or staying in bed a little bit longer. I won't tell you that there's a magic number of hours that you're supposed to get each night. It will be different for everyone. I slept about 10 hours a night when I was first detoxing and healing from autoimmune disease. Now I get seven and a half to eight hours nightly and I feel rested and strong when I wake up. Maybe it will look different. Maybe it will look like that for you or maybe it will be simply tacking on an hour somehow and calling it good. What is important is learning how to make sleep a priority. Okay, okay, how, this is all fine and dandy, but how do we actually do it? How do we actually get a better sleep routine? In my coaching practice, I have had the opportunity to help clients who suffer from autoimmune disease reverse the damage of their body and gain back their independence using food as medicine. Whenever I think about sleep and its many challenges, I am reminded of my client who not only had insomnia, but had also developed anxiety about going to bed and her bed itself. It started a few years prior with her autoimmune disease diagnosis. Having never experienced anxiety or insomnia, she wasn't sure how to correct these problems. Obsessing over any area of our life, including our health, isn't a healthy practice. My client, my client Tara became obsessed with the idea of sleep, but her obsession and anxiety made it impossible to sleep. Tara would sit up all night counting the amount of rest that she would get if she fell asleep at that exact moment, and of course not being able to fall asleep at that exact moment, actual fall asleep. For her, obsession was not sleeping created, for her, the obsession with not sleeping created anxiety around her bed and bedroom. Sleep is a learned behavior, so Tara had to retrain her brain when it came to sleep. First, she changed some things around her room so that it wasn't exactly the same. Then she decided to wear an eye mask so she couldn't see the cloth at night. Lastly, she changed the way she thought about not getting sleep. Because she's a busy mom and it's loud and busy all day long, I told her to imagine on the days that she cannot fall asleep, herself just quietly resting and that, was, that it was okay to not fall asleep. Sometimes in life, we attach so much value to an outcome that we forget to focus on what it is that will take to get it there, get us there. Tara didn't start sleeping more hours right away, but over time she developed better sleeping habits and didn't worry about the days that she didn't. Now knowing that she was providing her body with a much needed quiet rest, and sometimes that's enough. Everyone starts from a different place with this step, and that is okay. Do not lose faith. Start to look for patterns in your sleep behaviors. It is also important to know where you are starting by calculating how much you are typically getting. First, start paying attention to your current bedtime routine. Do you fall asleep watching TV or reading? What time are you falling asleep and what time are you waking up? Next, decide what the best way to end your day would be. There are several ways to create a better bedtime routine. Did you have one of those as a kid? My kids look like this. Each night we eat dinner, take a bath, read two books, get tucked in, and sing songs. They have been doing this routine their whole lives and do not know anything else. When we go on vacation or interrupt their routine, they have difficulties getting to bed. Our brains build not only habits, but also habit recognition. Researchers have studied this phenomenon and found that our body comes to expect the outcome of a habit or routine. The girls' bodies have come to expect sleep. I suggest finding a routine that works for you. I had to make some serious changes in my house in order to start my routine, including no electronics or TV in the bedroom. I turn off all the electronics and screens about an hour before bed. During that time, I like to read or talk to my family. I also changed into my comfortable clothes to cue my body that it's time to be relaxed. After that, after an hour, I lie in my bed and read with a soft light or take 10 to 15 minutes of quiet time to breathe and reflect on the day, not to create a to-do list. Celebrate the wins and express gratitude. It took me about six months of sleep training to finally fall asleep quick and stay asleep all night. It took diligence, but now my brain doesn't know any other way. 
This is my new normal and my habit. Sleep is essential to our bodies as water and love. Start making sleep a priority and miracles can start happening. Soon you'll wake up full of energy from a restful night's sleep and your body will thank you with loads of energy for the day and most importantly, a healthy body. Action steps. For the next 10 days, keep a sleep diary. Keep track of the time you fall asleep and the time you wake up and whether you wake up at any point during the night. After you feel your current sleep habits, see if there are any areas that you can adjust or get more quality sleep at night create a bedtime routine. Chapter 16, movement. When one thing tugs at a single, single thing in nature, he finds it all attached to the rest of the world. John Muir. The exact moment that I finally, that I was finally sick of feeling sick was when I couldn't run anymore. I used to run. It all started in fifth grade. I was an abnormally tall girl with long legs. The track coach asked me if I wanted to try out for the team, and that was the first day of the rest of my life. I don't know that if at that age I could fully comprehend what it was exactly about running that I enjoyed. I just did it and did it often. I would run to the store, run home from school, or run to a friend's house. It became a new freedom for me, like nothing I had ever experienced. No one could talk to you when you're running, and at the same time, at that time, there were no such thing as an iPod or phones, musical devices to run with. In order to be a part of the track team in elementary school, I had to practice with that team after school, which consisted of running one mile, because that was the race length, and one or two meets a month. The only area to compete was the one mile race. Every day at practice, I would run near a particular group of girls, but they would always come in first, second, with me in third. Every single practice went this way. And yet every single meet, I came in first. I didn't know why or how, other than I just liked being alone so much that I got in front of everyone so that I didn't have to run near them. I enjoyed running so much because it offered me an escape and a place to think all at once. There were two pivotal points in my per personal health journey that triggered my health decline. The first was in high school, right before being diagnosed with depression and anxiety, when I developed stress fractures from running too often on shin splints. And the second was right before my celiac diagnosis when I developed stress fractures in my left leg. Movement to me has always meant running, not just a mile here or there, but running to get lost and to think. Since my autoimmune diagnosis and the stress fractures, I have been unable to run. Not being able to run forced me to change my definition of movement. I had to learn new ways to move my body without causing further harm while also promoting optimal health. I have tried various classes in gyms from CrossFit to Jazzercise. I have finally settled on the perfect things for me. Regular hikes in nature. I make sure to get out in nature at least once a week. Even if I just walk the dirt trail in my neighborhood, I mainly want to be among the trees and get fresh air. I do not try to hike in the, I do try to hike in the mountains a few times a month. I love to go first thing in the morning when it isn't too hot. I love the fresh air and waking up, working up a little sweat in the process. After a good hike day, I try to take the rest of the day easy. I enjoy brunch and relax with my friends and family or do simple tasks for my business. For me, it was more important to allow my body to rest after hiking because I tend to recover faster that way. Pilates reformer classes. I found Pilates only recently. I, have tried every, I had tried everything else at that point. I bought a package of four private sessions and fell in love in the first few minutes. I am no longer built for high speed, intense workouts. I cannot do timed reps and sets of anything without seriously hurting the next day. Pilates is exactly the opposite of all of those things. Gentle and low impact while still allowing you to work up a sweat and leaving you sore the next day or so. It, all, it works all the smaller muscles to help keep your body in proper position. Having autoimmune disease can sometimes be painful, but when my body is in the correct position, I feel much better for much longer. Walking, my personal favorite. I love to walk. I love to walk anywhere. I love to go to new places and walk everywhere. I once went to New York City with a friend and we walked eight or more miles every day. We wanted to explore in only the way you can explore by walking. Sometimes I go for a walk where the intention is really is to really walk and I will make a quick almost jog of it. Other times I like to go clear my head or think something through with fewer distractions. During those times, I like to get lost and explore. I tend to take my time and walk for the sake of exploration and clarity. The human body was meant to be moved in specific ways every day. Our bones and muscles are capable of doing many more things than our predominantly sedentary society has promoted. 
Our ancestors used to hunt, climb, and forage for food, as well as to work to prepare it. These tasks took a wide range of mobility. Today, because we tend to sit at desks or in the same seated position for many hours in the day, we are losing that range of mobility and flexibility. The muscles and tendons in our body can lose flexibility if they are not being used. For instance, a person whose natural stance is hunched over can become more increasingly difficult and even more painful to stand up straight because the flexibility will, be, will have been less in those areas and actually cause stretching or aching pain. Incorporating a regular stretching regimen into your routine would be really helpful in keeping this flexibility as well as adding into your ability to properly detoxify your body. Exercise ju isn't just for our physical health and appearance. It is also instrumental in our physiological health. Countless studies have shown that exercise is an imperative component for health. Research in this field has shown that people who exercise suffer less cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, osteoporosis, mental health disorders, the list goes on and on and on. In order to have a complete health program, you have to eat the foods that are best for your body and you have to move. Movement is going to look a lot different for everyone and is going to feel different for everyone. Do not get frustrated if you are not as happy going to the same gym or classes as all your friends are. Maybe you just haven't found your one thing yet. The important thing is to start moving, start taking new classes. Maybe your thing will be swimming laps or dancing or Pilates or bar. You just have to start somewhere, but start at your own pace. If you haven't been moving a lot lately, your daily life may be looking like this. Sit for 30 minutes, drive to work. Sit for four hours at work. Sit for lunch. Sit for four hours at work. Sit for a 30 minute drive home. Sit for dinner. Sit for TV. If this looks familiar, you need to start by moving a little bit more each day. Maybe every 30 minutes at work, take a lap around your desk or do a few stretches. If you haven't been moving much lately, you cannot just jump into a fully regimented workout plan or you'll risk getting injured. If you start slowly and build a practice, then you will make time for these things. You will make these things habits and you will be moving more in no time. Maybe build up to, a, to walking around the block every night after dinner or before breakfast in the morning and increase in the distance each week. Then you can start taking group classes and explore options for moving your body in the way that it was intended. The major takeaway here is that our bodies were built to move, not just for vanity or to look a certain way, but to actually help the body to do all it is capable of doing. Start where you are comfortable and set reasonable goals for yourself. Here is an example for someone who is primarily a sedentary lifestyle, but has cleared by a medical doctor to begin exercising. Week one, walk around your home three times a day. Week two, walk around the block or a track one time. Week three, walk around the block or a track two times. No matter where you start or what your limitations are, start moving your body in any way that it can move and start now. Action steps. Write down three new things that you are going to try to move your body a little bit more. This can be as simple as, I'm going to walk up the stairs one extra time a day, or I'm going to park at the back of the parking lot. Or it can be more specific, like I am going to walk one mile by the end of this month, and these are the three things I am going to do to make sure it happens. Chapter 17, Peer Pressure. I gotta stop treating people like I owe them something. Tupac. The funniest thing seems to happen when you decide to make a life change for yourself. No matter what it may be, people tend to come out of the woodwork with reasons why you shouldn't embark on that journey. I know some pretty amazing naysayers who will take any opportunity to tell me why I shouldn't do something or shouldn't pursue a goal. There are always several legitimate reasons for discouraging you. Well, that won't actually work. Do you know how hard it is to do that or how much time it will take? Do you know that at least 50% fail in the first year? And my personal favorite, you won't even be happy doing that. It is amazing that these comments often come from those we love and respect the most. I think they feel as if they are doing us a favor by saving us from future hurt. But truly, it just knocks us down a rung. I have come to understand through research and various counseling sessions that these people are not out to hurt you. They are out to protect themselves. Most people are living with insecurities we do not always understand and that they may not even know that they have. And because of those insecurities, they can see your personal health goals as a direct threat to how they view themselves. If you get healthier and you have the strength to do that, then what does that say about them? We often get so caught up in what other people think of us when the reality is, is that everyone else is just worried about the same things and only thinking about themselves. We perceive that we are constantly being judged by others for our actions, but really it is coming from other people's judgment of themselves. 
Humans have very few survival skills. We are not born with fangs, claws, or inking abilities. Instead, we humans survived by combining resources with others and protecting each other. It is beneficial to support each other for all of our benefit. Those biological needs push us to be social creatures. For the benefit of survival, we need to be part of a community. There is pressure, high stakes pressure to belong. So much so that in order to fit in, we will mold ourselves into whatever we think is socially accepted. We want to be included so badly that we start to question ourselves. Will one bite really hurt me? Maybe they're right. Maybe I'm not cut out for this. I will probably fail anyway, so what's the point of trying? Any of these sound familiar? These phrases have definitely been part of my inner mantra at times. This type of argument with ourselves can hurt and hinder our abilities to grow. It can be challenging to fight off these types of comments and vicious cycles of thoughts that follow. The long-term effects of these types of questions can be quite damaging. When you are making any change in your life, even changing something like going to bed earlier, you will get comments from other people. It is inevitable. However, you can help yourself continue to grow even when others are resisting your change. Instead of trying something new, suggest making these changes part of your everyday, or making these changes part of the very fabric of make, what makes you who you are. When you make a lifestyle change part of who you are, then it will be difficult for other people to deter you from your goals. I am. I am is a very powerful preface. Telling somebody that you don't eat something because it doesn't fit with your lifestyle anymore is a much stronger statement than I am trying this new diet, or I am trying to lose weight, or I am trying to be healthier. Your brain doesn't understand, I think, or I am trying. Remember from chapter four that our brains are lazy and they won't change unless they really have to. Here are some things that you can do to ensure the success of your of any change in your diet, in any change in your life, including diet. Get a buddy. If you don't have someone in your house who's willing to make changes with you, then find someone who will. Maybe it's a friend, sibling, or cousin. If you don't have one of these, then hire a coach. You need someone you can talk to regularly and get support from. As you get further in your journey, you will meet more like-minded people and you can surround yourself with them. Any change takes time and the more time passes, the easier it will be. Soon enough, you will have a tribe of people supporting you. Make it part of who you are. Practice saying your new habits out loud. I am a vegetarian and I am trying not to eat meat are very different. You will be challenged less as your confidence in yourself and your beliefs become stronger. If you are allergic to peanuts, no one would ever push you eating peanut butter. Eating something you've been told you've told yourself you are removing from your diet will most likely not kill you, but it will hurt that part of you that you've been trying to change. Our brain is lazy. It builds habits to keep us from burning through too much energy and it doesn't want to change. If you tell yourself that you are going to stop eating something, your brain will fight you to keep the habit the same and will look for evidence that you do not actually want to change. Here are some examples. Thought. I am going to go to the gym every day. Brain. Well, you didn't go today, so I guess we don't have to change that habit. Thought. I am eating clean now. Brain. What about that donut you ate this morning from the break room? Nope, don't have to change. Start giving your brain cues that you want to change. Show your body and your brain that you are ready to change and then start changing. Start giving the proof that you are actually doing it. Our brilliant brain picks up the cues in the environment so that it can anticipate all of your needs. By giving your brain little cues that you are ready to change by actually making small changes, you will find that new habits and health can come really easy. Some things you can try are to clean out your pantry of all the food items that you wish to stop consuming. Stock fresh foods in your fridge and your pantry that are exciting to you. And spend a moment each day thinking about the little changes that you have made in the right direction. Give yourself a little pat. You can stay prepared for challenges you might face like a wedding or a party that you know will tempt you with foods that you are avoiding by planning your meals in advance or eating ahead of time. I always eat a meal before I go to a party. Then while I'm there, I can snack on fruit or vegetable trays without feeling like I'm missing out. Each time you give yourself these little cues that you are passionate about making changes, the brain will make the tiny adjustments. It will continue to get easier and easier to incorporate your new lifestyle goals. Celebrate wins. I cannot stress this next part enough. Celebrate wins. When you succeed in a day, celebrate it. If you went for a walk, if you danced while mopping the floor for a little extra sweat session, or if you had a smoothie full of superfoods and took your vitamins, celebrate it. 
these seemingly small steps add up to huge successes, not to mention celebrating and giving yourself a win, no matter how big it is, changes the brain. Prepare. Anytime you are making a change in life, build up a fortress around yourself. You wouldn't go on a road trip without some snacks and some gear, right? Why would you start a change without first preparing? Give yourself a little time to prepare before you start something new. If you were going to go to bed earlier, start by turning off the electronics earlier or starting a bedtime routine. If you are working on your diet, fill your pantry and fridge with your favorite clean eats. Get rid of all the foods that might tempt you or sway your beliefs. Nothing is worse than when the brain tries to convince you that you don't need to change. I cannot tell you how many times I have set my alarm to get up to work out. I've tried all the tips, put, on, put the alarm on the other side of the room, set the clothes out before going to bed, getting a buddy to meet with. No matter what I did, my brain started spinning the minute the alarm would go off. I would hear something like, start tomorrow. You had to wake up to pee so you didn't get a full night's sleep. Tomorrow you can go to bed with the workout clothes on and you'll for sure get up then. Do you do this too? Again, that is a crazy smart brain of ours trying to keep its patterns in place. I always like to think of my grumpy old grandma when I, grandpa when I was a kid. He wouldn't change anything ever if he didn't have to. We get set in our ways and things work, so why change it? Most importantly, know that other people, when other people are judging you for making new life choices, they are really just scared you are judging them for not changing too. We can only control what we do, not when anybody else does. When we, but when we do not have, but we do not have to own their crap either. They tell you to develop a thick skin so that you don't so that they don't, things don't get to you. What they don't tell you is that your thick skin will keep everything getting out too. Love, intimacy, vulnerability, I don't want that. Thick skin doesn't work anymore. I want to be transparent and translucent. For that to work, I won't own other people's shortcomings and criticisms. I won't put what you say about me on my load. Viola Davis. Action steps. Get a health buddy or accountability partner. Buy all of your favorite healthy snacks and stock the fridge and pantry. Make your goals part of who you are.